so I um, will be talking about a geometric theory of algorithms, and that's a work with uh, Alberto Neibo from uh, IHPST. So Alberto is doing philosophy, I'm doing computer science, so I will try to explain where this comes from. So the, I'm not sure I make it in five minutes, but this is the objective. So why I care about this question of algorithm. Then I have a part about historical and philosophical backgrounds, and that's mainly Alberto's expertise. And so I took his slides, and it was for a one-hour talk, so I, I didn't want to, to make a mess out of his slides, so I just grade the parts I want to be talking about. And um, if you want, so this will be at two times speed or something. So if you want the full slides, they're online, and so you can read them you know, at, at your rhythm. And then I will explain our proposal, which is a geometric theory of algorithms. And well, hopefully, it will be convincing. And if it's not, yes, it will be good for discussions. So the origin story is complexity theory. And that's uh, actually, that's not today. That, that's like 15 years ago. So I think that the graph now is like five times bigger, bigger than this. And, and somewhere here, you have some kind of a, a lot of arrows there. And I think this is log space. And here you have p space. right? And, and there's a lot of classes in between. And basically, we, don't, we know these two are distinct, but we really don't understand what's happening between. right? And so that, that's a question that lots of people have asked. And there's a problem, which is that the techniques we have are, were proved useless. So basically, we don't have any methods. And, and this is because of two results, which are called barriers. Well, actually, actually, it's three results, but well, two of them are, are quite alike. And so I will try to explain how I understand these results and why I, I think it's related to the question of algorithms. So the two results are these ones. So the first one is called relativization. So it comes from a, a result of uh, 75, I think. Um, it's about what happens to the problem p time versus np time when you use oracles. And it turns out that if you use, you can find two oracles such that the, problems become, uh, the problem becomes uh, solvable. And in one case, it's an equality. In the other, it's an inequality. The second, so this, this means actually that if your proof method doesn't see the oracle, then it cannot prove that the classes are equal or disjoint. Because then it would, it, it would be incoherent with either this or this. And, and the second barrier is called natural proofs. And this is a very complicated result. But basically, it says that if you can capture the complex functions by um, predicates which is decidable in reasonable time, then this predicate cannot be used to separate complexity classes. And so that means that basically, if you reduce, so a, a complexity class is a predicate on Boolean functions, but it's undecidable. So this means that if you quotient too much the set of programs, then you will be unable to prove separations. So that's what I write here, right? So the first one says, if you want to separate, if you want to prove that two classes are disjoint, then you need to be able to care about, to, to talk about the oracles. So you need to be able to talk about every principle in the model. If you, a natural proof tells you that if you want to separate classes, you, don't, you cannot hope to do it if you caution too much the set of programs. And so for me, it's related to this question. So basically, people have asked what is good computable function, and we have an answer to it, or at least in some cases. But the question that's, that we really care about in complexity is what is an algorithm? What's a program? Because if, if you don't want to quotient them too much, then you have to understand what they are. So this is the origin story of why I care about this question. And now I will 
So the conclusion is that we need a mathematical theory of algorithms. And I will try to explain a bit of the history. So, so that's the first slide of Alberto's talk. Um, so yes, it's a pro programmatic talk. Um, so I will explain some uh, of the form formal framework. It's, it's not very technical. Um, and it's the basis of a project we have and, and we're, we're working on right now. Um, OK, so the idea is to understand what an algorithm should be. And, and the first thing is to realize that the church Turing, Turing thesis is actually not about algorithms. And then um, I will explain a few proposals. We're, we're not the first ones to say that, right? So there are a few proposals uh, of definitions for what an algorithm should be. And we'll discuss these and, and some of their limits. And then uh, I will explain our proposal, right? So this is the background. So again, I will let you read the gray parts. And I care about this, which is basically today we don't have a reasonable definition or at least a consensus of what algorithm, how a, the notion of algorithm should be defined. So yeah, we'll see if we can do something like this. So yeah, when you read papers about algorithms, usually it's described in a sketchy way as some kind of recipe, like you know, cooking recipe or something. So it's a sequence of steps, and, and there's nothing formal about this. And the, the best things that you can find usually is a reference to Turing and the church Turing thesis. Okay? So there's a lot of different quote, quotations there. Um, many, many work will just talk about the church Turing thesis. But in fact, if you look at Turing's paper, it's not about algorithms. The, the word algorithm doesn't appear in it. And it talks about what effectible, effectively computable functions are. So, so it's about a notion of function, not a notion of algorithm, of computation. So basically what it does is says, we have three different ways of defining what an efficiently comput uh, effectively computable function is, and these three are equivalent, right? So it says something about the functions, which you say the sets of functions that you compute in each model is the same, but it's not about how you compute it. So, yeah, some people say that an algorithm is a Turing machine, but we, we don't agree with this because we see the three different definitions, so Turing, computability, and lambda definability, and recursiveness, as three different, different models of computation that turn out to have to define the set, same set of functions, right? So the church Turing thesis is about functions, but we care about the algorithms. And, and in fact, we're not the, s the first ones to, so yeah, maybe I, I'll skip that a bit. Uh, let me say, yeah, functions. I'm not following the slides, I'm sorry. Um, the, um, we care about the functions. We don't care about the functions, we care about the algorithms. And so the church Turing thesis is not enough for us, right? For instance, if you have a Turing machine that computes a, pr a given function, you can compute the same function in uh, lambda calculus, but the way you compute the dynamics, the, the steps in the computation won't be the same, right? You just know that in the end, you compute the same function. So you, you give it a, an input, the two different implementations will give you the same output. So yeah, I won't do this example, but basically you can find examples of computing Fibonacci by uh, recursion or with a for loop. Yeah, you can do it here in Python, for instance. And, and these two programs will compute the same function. We know it, but we don't want to say they're the same program. There's the same algorithm, right? Uh, so there are all the other limits to the church Turing thesis. Uh, it, it's basically limited to determinism. Um, yeah, we don't want to be limited to determinism. 
uh, especially now we have uh, you know probabilistic programs, uh, concurrent programs. So so this is very limiting right now. So as I said, we're not the first to realize this, right? Uh, I mean, it, it's not a new idea that functions and programs are not the same, right? And, and that in the end, the church Turing analysis is not sufficient if we want to talk about uh, computer programs. So the first one we identified is Kolmogorov uh, with Uspensky. I think he was his PhD student. Um, so, yeah, we, we discussed that on the slides, but not during my talk. Uh, there's another one more recent, which is Mostrovakis. So Mostrovakis basically defines a notion of recursor, which generalizes the no notion of a recursive function, right? Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not tied to a model of computation, and it's a very abstract notion. So the limits of this approach, as we see, is that it's limited to the functional point of view. Um, and, and in fact, you always compute functions. So that's one other thing which um, current computers do and that, that we don't see in the church during this is that, for instance, uh, programs won't, don't need to be input-output, uh, to have an input-output behavior, right? So if you think in terms of, uh, I don't know, servers, so these are programs that run forever and, and they're, they're just there to get some information and answer to it, but you cannot see that as a function. Or at least not directly, right? Uh, of course, you can always encode things. Okay, and so the second approach is Gorevich. And Gorevich uh, has, so I think it's the most, uh, uh, finalized or, or the, the most ma ma mature uh, proposal. Um, and and Goevi's proposal is, is more, it's more closely related to Turing machines. So basically it's a generalization of Turing machines, but the notion of state is richer. And so you, 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 you define states as first order terms. Right, so when you want to define an abstract state machine, that, that's the notion of machine of, of Goevich, um, you first choose a signature, so you choose a first order structure, and then the program, the computation, is represented as a way of updating this structure. Right, and, and you can see the first order structure as a sort of generalization of the... <laughs> yeah, a generalization of the... Um, uh, tape of the Turing machine, right? So it, it's like a tape, but with a lot more structure. Uh, so ASM can actually deal with non-determinism, they can deal with probability, probabilities, uh, but we we'll still feel there's some things that cannot, they cannot do. And, and one example we like is that, so we, we're questioning the question of the, the, what is an algorithm, and, and we're talking about programs, but actually algorithms come from way before programs, right? So we took this example that could be thought of as an algorithm, which is the uh, Euclid 1.1. So, so um, the point is that you have two points and you want to construct uh, an equilateral triangle from these two points, right? And how do you do this? And, and Euclid actually gives an algorithm to do this. So you first do construct the circle um, around A, then you construct the circle around B, this gives you two points, then you choose one. So you see there's some kind of non-determinism here, and then you build the triangle from there, okay? So we'd like to see that as a kind of algorithm. And well, does the, do the two proposals of Moshevakis and Gorevich, are, capable, are they cap capable of, of accounting for this, for this? So of course, that's what I said before. As, as a, you can al always encode things. So you could, uh, it's not here, it's here. 
So you could always encode all of this, right? So you, you have points and you see them as pairs of rational numbers and then you will compute some equations and find the solution of a system of equations and you will find the intersection point and you can construct this. But it, does that really correspond to the procedure I just explained? So our point is that it's not because the procedure of Euclid's construction is to construct the circle itself, right? And here we're just computing the point of this intersection. So we'd like to have some model in which you can actually construct the circle and represent the procedure itself. Okay, I think that's, that's basically what. Um, yes, I have 20 minutes, something like this. Okay, so I, I'll let you, I, I put the slides online, I don't have time to go through all this and I'm not the expert on this part. So now I will present some, f our formal proposition. And I will go back to this example of Euclid and, and I will try to convince you that, that we have a better representation of it. So the first notion I want to explain is that of what we call an abstract model of computation. So for us, an abstract model of computation is a monoid action. So I, I know the, the, the people here are from very different backgrounds. So if you are a mathematician, yeah, this is a morphism from M to the endomorphisms of X. If you're not a mathematician, you think of, you have a space X and then you have a set, a family, a collection of functions on this. So functions from X to itself. And this family should contain the identity and it should be closed under composition. So if you take two functions in the set, you compose them and the, the resulting functions should still be in the set, right? And that's, I, I'm not defining anything more, right? It, it's just this. So what is this? This is, so usually we, we will be considering monoid actions. So where the monoid is generated by a finite number of elements. So a finite number of functions, and these ones will be the instructions of our model of computation. Okay? So this is very abstract, so let's do the example of Turing machines. Um, so Turing's model of computation, if you know it, um, so the, the way we can pre represent this here is the following. So you, we take a space, so this is a space of sequences, infinite sequences, right? So indexed by Z. And these sequences contain zeros, ones, and stars. And there's only a finite number of zeros and ones. So basically, it's this, right? This is, the, this is an element of x. So at some point, there's only stars on the right and the left. And this represents the different configurations in which the Turing tape, can be, the tape of the Turing machine can be in. OK? And the idea is that you think of the zeroth element, so the, the, it's not the center because it's infinite, but you think of, of it as a center, and this is where the head of the Turing machine is placed. And then you will see that every in basic instructions in the Turing machine model corresponds to a function from this space to this space. It takes a configuration and it leads to a new configuration. So for instance, you have right, the function right, so uh, it's called right because it's actually the same as moving the head of the Turing machine to the right. So what th does it do? It takes the sequence and it shifts it on the left, so you see the, the gray lines there. Right, so I just shift it and this is the same as moving the head. So this instruction is move the head to the right and you can do that for the left, right? You can move the, the head to the left, and you can write an element at the zeros index. And so you can write a zero, you can write a one, you can write a star. And all these functions are defined on all the different sequences, and they produce a new sequence. So it's a function from x to x, right? So basically, when you, when you take the monoid generated by this, you're saying, I can do sequences of instructions right, 
and I'm, I'm still in the monoid. So this is how the action represents the model of computation. No, no, you, you have five maps. Sorry, but what about the right construction? The what? The, the right construction. Oh, no, okay, 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 okay. The next. Okay, sorry. No, it's element wise, but it's, it's one function on X. Okay, so this is the model of, of computation. And now, what's, what would be a program in this, well, for this notion of model of computation? So, a program is something called a graphing. So uh, I didn't come up with the name. Uh, it's, it's taken from ergodic theory. And so the idea is that what you do is build a graph from this monoid action, right? So you will pick things. So you, you, you will have a collection of pairs. Actually, it's not pairs. So you see in gray, you, you, you in practice, you, you, ha you add more elements, but, but let's think of it as pairs right now. So you just take pairs, and the first element of the pair is a subset. It's a subset of x. So it's a subset of configurations of the machine model. And then you pick an element of m. So this is an instruction you will apply to elements in s. right? So this is a graph-like structure, and, and if I give you the definition of a Turing machine, usually you have the graph, on tr the transition graph of the Turing machine. Well, the transition graph com directly translates into this, right? You take subspaces, and so the subspaces are defined by the condition on which uh, you, you apply a given instruction, and then uh, you have the instruction with it. So, so each Transition graph gives you something like this. But there's, there's a little thing that I'm interested, uh, interested in. It's that I quotient these elements, these objects, a bit. And the quotient is the following. So if you have two maps, two edges, right, with the same element, the same instruction, so you're doing the same operation, but you're doing it on two different subspaces, S1 and S2. And I'm saying this is the same as doing as having one edge where you take the source as s1 union s2 and you apply m right so it's just what this says is that what i care about is how points are sent to points and not how the structure is defined in the graph like uh, manner right so so let's do it the other way i have m and i say i apply m either if I see a zero uh, at the zeroth element, or I see a one, I will go to the right. Then it's the same as saying, if I see a zero, I go to the right. If I see a one, I go to the right. Okay. But this is interesting, because once you quotient with this, if you restrict to uh, a notion of deterministic graphing, then this corresponds to partial dynamical systems. Right? So, so you, you boil it down to a point-by-point, point, a point-wise action in some way. OK, so again, this is very abstract. Let's do an example. So if, you if I take the Turing machine uh, example, I can define three different subsets, right? And these are the ones you care when you do Turing machines. So you will have the subset x, a, is the set of sequences for which there's an a at the zeroth position. So this, this means that the machine is reading a zero at, in this configuration, right? And it could be, it could, so x1 is you see a one, x star is you see a star, okay? I have three sets. And then I can look at this, so this is defined, in, I, I represented it as an automata because uh, it's a very simple uh, machine. <laughs> so what does it do? It takes an in input, it looks, um, it's in a state called even, right? Uh, if it sees a zero, it stays in even. Uh, if it sees uh, one, sorry. If it sees a zero, it goes to odd. Uh, zero, it goes back to even. So what does it do? It accepts a sequence of zeros and ones, if and only if there's an even number of zeros. 
OK? And this can be represented as the following. So you say that if you're in x0, so you see that this part here is about control states. The, these are the, the states even, accept, odd, and reject. I didn't talk about this, but this is just very easy to add in the model, and you need it. And you'll say, if I'm reading a 0, and I'm in the even state, then I go right. And I'm moving to the odd, odd state. Then if I'm reading a 0, I s I'm in odd state, so I go right, and I'm moving to the even state, etc. Right? So this collection of edges is the same as the Turing machine. So we can try to write it like this, right? So if you see a zero, you are in the odd position, then you go to even, and you go right. Well, the, the point is this is not really good representation, because when you see a zero and you go right, well, you can see, you can arrive to the space where you see a zero, a one, or a star. So, so this representation is that, that good, right? You do right. And you can arrive there, you can arrive there, you can arrive there. So the dynamics is a bit complicated. OK. So this doesn't come from nowhere. So this comes from work I did before uh, caring about complexity. Um, and this comes from work in logic. And, and the point, the only thing I will care about here is that if I take this notion of program, then I'm able to construct a model of some fragment of linear logic on it. So here, you should think of it as, so the logic is not here to constrain the program. So it's, it's not like you're, doing, uh, you're adding types because you don't want to write some of the program. You construct a logic that just describes what the programs are doing. Right, so, so the question, for instance, is this program of this type is not undecidable? But you can define the m model of logic on this. Okay? And, and so you have the abstract model of computation, and the set of programs has a language that you can use to talk about it. Okay. So this will come back at the end. Um, and so basically, my, my work in complexity is based on this, because then you can look at programs that compute decision problems, right? Because you have a type of natural numbers, you have a type of Booleans, and you can ask, what are the programs that compute decision problems? What are the functions they compute in this model, right? So let's go back to Euclid um, a minute. Um, so this is very abstract uh, model of computation. So my model of computation is the following. So you take x, and x is the space of pairs, right? So you, you can see here uh, the pairs are the si and the xj. So I have this notation with the double uh, columns there. And the idea is that the first family is a s finite sequence of subspaces, and the second family is a finite sequence of points. And I will start from nothing, and I will build, not, not from nothing, but, but from uh, some information, and I will build new subsets and new points from this. Right? So now you can define functions from x to x, and what they do. So you take a sequence of subspaces, a sequence of points, and you say, I can exchange them. Right? There are sequences, so I, I, I am allowed to reorganize them. And that is important because of these functions there below. OK? So the second one is circle. So what does it do? You have subsp uh, subspaces, points, and you keep the subspaces, you keep the points, and you add a new subspace which is defined, so it's a circle uh, centered at xn and at distance, the distance between xn and xn minus 1. So you take your two last points and you construct a circle from them. And you add this circle in the set of subspaces you've defined. 
you can define the inter intersection. So you just take two subspaces you've constructed and you define the subspace, uh, which is the intersection of the two. Right? And I have this interesting construct, which is called pick. So it says that you have a sequence of subspaces and you're allowed to pick one element in one subset. So this is a bit different and because, so this is why there's an R here. It's, it's not a function, it's a relation. But everything I've defined works with relations. So I didn't explain what kind of endomorphisms I, I, I care about. And so in this case, you can, no, I, we, we didn't do it. Um, in this case, you can actually represent the construction, the Euclid construction, right? So what do you do? You start with two points and no subspaces. Then you construct the first circle. So now we have one circle and two points. You exchange the two points. This, this is the next step. Then you use these two points to construct the other circle. Then you use the intersection to build the two points. And then you pick one of them, right? So I didn't write down the segment, but you can construct the segment. It's just that the slide is of finite length, right? Um, so I hope I've convinced you that this actually corresponds to the construction of Euclid, that I, I actually build the, the circle itself, right? So we like this example. OK. So I, I was talking, I'm supposed to talk about algorithms, so now I'll talk about algorithms. So our point of view is that algorithms are <laughs> finite lab label graphs. That seems stupid. So why is that? So for us, uh, a graphing, so a program, implements an algorithm if you have a morphism from the algorithm, so from the labeled graph, into a graphing representative. So the graphing representative <coughs> is a graph-like structure, you know, with the uh, elements of the action, of the monoid action, right? But the notion of morphism here should be a bit difficult to define. So why? Because th the principle is that you, know, you, you want it to be coherent in the sense that if you have a label on two different edges, you want them to be interpreted by the same instructions. Right? So the morphism takes the, label, the labels into account. But there's something more. And, and that's maybe the, the most complex part, but also the most inter interesting one is that we'd like that a given edge with a given label could be implemented not as a single instruction, but as a subroutine, right? So let, let's, I won't give the formal definition, uh, but I, I will give you an example. I, I don't know, it's not working, so I'm skipping things, okay. So I, I, I want to look at these examples. So this is a function that computes the GCD, right? And a function, a program that computes the GCD. Okay, and so I put in red what's important here, right? And this one is a, is a program that doesn't compute the GCD <laughs> because I, I'm not doing the um, remainder operation, but I'm taking a subtraction, right? Our point of view is that these are actually implementations of the same algorithm. Why? Because the algorithm itself, when, when you give an algorithm, there's an implicit information about how you want in operations to be interpreted. But in fact, when you write down an algorithm, whether you use the division on the reals or division on the complex numbers or divisions on the, on the rational numbers is never explained, right? An algorithm is just saying, I'm doing division there. So our point of view is to go to the most abstract way and say, I have one operation here, and each time this operation appears, I will use the same instruction in the program, but who knows if it's actually doing what the 
person expected it to do when writing the algorithm. Okay? And, and, and in the end, we'd like to recover this information of what the operation should compute really. But this is additional information, right? This, is, uh, this will be given by the logic. Uh, so these are the two examples. We say they both interpret, implement the same algorithm. We'll call this A. These two are two other examples. And we say, well, they also implement the same algorithm A prime. What's interesting is the difference between GCD1 and GCD2. So the point is that we want these two to implement the same algorithm of these two above. We want to say this is actually also implementing this, the, the, the algorithm there, because the remainder has been detailed. So instead of computing it in one step, we used a subroutine. We, we used a subprogram to compute it. Okay? And so the definition of morphism actually should contain this pasting so of, of, of graphs in some way. But this program implements an algorithm which is the same as this one, which is more detailed and says, I actually implement the, the remainder by using subtraction. And I think this is the actual uh, original uh, Euclidean uh, uh, GCD construction, right? But, but if, you do, if you look at this more detailed algorithm, then the first GCD doesn't implement it. OK? Yeah, so I actually uh, exchanged slides. Um, so wha why is it good? No, I, I didn't talk about this. So, so why, is, why is it good? It's, there's one thing which is interesting is that when people ask what is an algorithm in the literature, they usually, so the first notion they came up with is that it's an equivalence of programs, some equivalence class of programs. But it turns out that this doesn't work. So th there's, there's a paper by, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the reference. I think it's the, in the end somewhere. Yes, it's this one. It's uh, Blas, Dershowitz, and Gurevich, where they actually show that if you define an algorithm as an equivalence class of programs up to small changes, then it turns out to be incorrect. I mean, in the sense that they take two programs and they argue that they shouldn't be the same algorithm, they shouldn't implement the same algorithm, and then they find a sequence of small steps for which you would agree that it won't change the algorithm it's implementing, but in the end you go from one to the other. Okay? So this point of view actually skips that. And it says that you have several notions of algorithm, and the notion of algorithm is actually a sort of approximation of what the program is doing. And, and you can have several levels of reading of a program and saying, I want the, the uh, remainder to be computed from subtraction. And then you, you have a more detailed algorithm, right? This also means that an algorithm is no longer, well, is not an equivalence class of programs. Okay. So I will finish with the big picture because this, uh, this is a lot of different things. And I'll try to give a, a broad idea of what's, so, so maybe this is my slide, so uh, probably Alberto is agree, agrees with it, but let's say it's me. So it's, if I say something stupid, then, then it, it's just my responsibility. So, so the big picture for me is this. So you have, so computation is related to physics in some way, because, well, in the end, what you want to do is take a physical device and compute, right? And so somehow you have this physical theory that you use to compute. So you can use uh, quantum theory to do quantum computers, right? Uh, you can do mechanical computers. You can use electronics. So you, you have to find a theory in which you can try to, com to construct some devices. And the computation lives there. A computation is a dynamical system. It's a dynamical process that you know, is created once by a program. 
So if you take a program and you run it twice, it does two computations for me, right? It's, that it's not happening at the same time. And this is coherent with probabilistic program, for instance. You take a probabilistic program, you run it twice, and it might not do the same computation, right? If I, if I pick a zero once, uh, one the other time, then it doesn't do the same. So there's a difference between computation and programs. Then you have this level of model of computation, which is described by monoe actions and graphings. And then you have this part about algorithms where you have the labeled graphs that correspond to this abstract structure of algorithms. And you have the logic that comes from the monoid action that should be able to talk to you about what the operation actually implement. And so maybe one, uh, I don't know how you say in, in English, an appel du pied. Uh, so I think this is interesting because it mixes two different views of computer science. Uh, there, there's the, the Turing machine dynamical system point of view. Well, there's a lot of people working on this. And, and there's the lambda calculus, uh, you know, uh, functional programming point of view. And, and there's usually no interactions between them. And, and I think in this picture, we can actually find a way to discuss. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Did you, uh, did you try to do this to a sorting algorithm? So for me, the question, what is an algorithm? Always the, the, the example is sorting algorithms, right? You have bubble sort and you have quick sort and they are not the same. But when you implement quick sort in Haskell or implement it in C, it looks very, very different, but you want that it's the same algorithm. So it's... Yes, yeah. so we haven't done a lot of examples, but that's a good idea, yeah. Thank you. So you can't say anything more about... I cannot say anything on the sorting okay. algorithm, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, I, I have a few questions, some of which I'll take offline. Um, but okay, so maybe a very high-level one, because um, I can't be the only one who's thinking this. So I, I think for sure, the, when you went through the Turing machine, you showed that it's a monoid action. Yeah, that that was fine. I think the thing I I, I that did I didn't find as convincing was that every monoid action of of a certain sort should form a model of computation. Like, so I think that some concrete elements are missing for me. Things like, so you were motivating from complexity theory, of course. Um, it's, it's not clear to me how you recover a lot of those cost models that we have. It's, um, maybe you could say something about the limits of this approach. So for example, you know, weird machines where we have alternation or random access or this kind of stuff. Do you see these as limits? Are these not what you're interested in? Uh, I would generally want you to say something in the other direction. Okay, so, so our point of view is that we're optimistic, so I think that if you give me a model, I can probably make it into a monoid action. Uh, but the other way around, so, so there are monoid actions that you don't want to see as computation, at least intuitively. Like, um, so you, you might want to impose that it's finitely generated. That's the first thing, right? The money is finitely generated. I think this is meaningful for if you want actual computers, right? Uh, but other limits, I'm, I'm not sure you want them because, uh, for instance, you know, people have started looking at, uh, you have models of computation that act on continuous uh, states and I don't want for at least some one class of monoid actions, do you have like a compilation result that can you compile into another, into Turing machines? As, as, a, as a sanity check. So if, if you can prove that some, Turing, uh, some monoid actions are? So, so I'm looking for like a Turing completeness kind of result. So, so we, when we come up with a model of computation or a programming language, we'll, we may show that it's equivalent to Turing machines. Is that meaningful? Is that yes, but it, or am, I, am I missing the point? Are you trying to you do something more abstract? Well, I think you, you're kind of missing the point because Turing, Turing completeness is about the functions you compute. And, and we care about the, the model of computation itself. So, so we, we want not only to compute the functions, but to represent the programs 
in a meaningful, in a faithful way in some way. But, but in particular, are you okay with computing uncomputable functions? Well, I mean, with, I'm, with I'm, an abstract I'm definition okay like monoid. This definition allows uh, uncomputable functions, yes. But I, I'm, I'm okay with it because I'm uh, capable of saying if I limit myself to these, then it corresponds to uh, Turing machines or I will compute only computable functions. Um, okay, I have more, but I'll take But, but the point is that, for instance, you, can, you could add the, the halting problem in your monoid, and then you can talk about uh, higher models. You want to do recursion theory in this? Or <laughs> but, but you see the point that I, I don't want to limit it. I, I, I'm sure you can define limitations or constraints on the monoid actions, but I'm not sure they're meaningful. So, so I don't want to, the, the, the whole theory works without this, right? So, so why limit to something that just do uh, computable it, functions? The, the reason would be to um, justify why you might have the right level of abstraction. So wh why is seeing it as a monoid action the correct level of abstraction for, to say something meaningful? But maybe for you it's meaningful because of the results you're getting. As yes, opposed and to for me it's meaningful because I can represent every model I've looked at in a meaningful way, in a faithful way. Okay. Yeah. Please. Uh, so you, you started by a picture of uh, complexity theory. Yes. And then you spoke about the notion of algorithm. Yes. So what's the link? So what's the complexity of an algorithm? So that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think you need to, to that this is linked to the questions. I think the complexity of an algorithm is linked to a cost model. Right? So if you take an algorithm as a label graph, then the question is, should I give cost, well, uh, should I consider that every label, every arrow is a cost one, or, or is it greater than this. And, and I think this is the choice of a cost model. And then you can check that if you implement it, then it corresponds to the right notion or not, right? But that's, I mean, the, the question is, is, I don't think there's a, an answer to it, and I, I think there shouldn't be one. For instance, in some sometimes you want to be able to say that uh, you compute on real numbers and, and you know, everything, every operation costs one. And, and sometimes you want to say that you approximate the, the real numbers and, and it will depend on the size of the representation. And, and both are interested, uh, interesting and, and I, I don't want to have limitation on this, I think. And, and then the relation comes from the fact that there's this idea that if you, if you represent, the, there are two things, so you can represent just functions and ask the question of complexity classes. You can represent all programs and ask the question of what functions are com computable or not. And, and somehow the barriers in complexity say that in between, if, if, you, if you look in between, if you go too, too close to the functions themselves, so you caution too much the set of programs, then you're not capable of separating, separating classes. So, so I'm trying to go the furthest away. I'm trying to have a model in which I represent faithfully the programs so that I know that, that there's no big quotient there and I know that it's still viable to try to do something about complexity. I was asking whether there were other questions. Okay, if not, then we can thank Duma again.